talking to us about some more fish parasites. Um, it's just, Good morning, everybody. I'm sorry you just had breakfast. You're going to hear about parasitic worms now, but that's what happens. And so I'm a fish parasitologist from SUNY Oneonta, and this is a picture of a nematode. I'll get back to this image in a few slides. Um, so the, the basis of my talk today is a, a long-term fish parasite at Otsego Lake, which uh, you've heard uh, reports about Otsego Lake at these meetings over the years, and it's a, it's a relatively well-studied lake. I, I arrived there in 2008 as a fish parasitologist and, and found that there's a lot of good information about the history of the lake in terms of the flora and fauna that are there, the species that have been introduced uh, prominently, such as the zebra mussel, and also species that are in decline or uh, extirpated from the lake. And so I'll point out here, as a parasitologist, um, there's a lot of gastropods that used to be in the lake that are no longer there. So that, that's relevant for a parasitologist uh, looking at trematode life cycles. Um, so this is a, an oligotrophic finger lake with both warm and cold water fisheries. And as I was saying, there's a good deal of information already about the lake in terms of the, the fish and the other species in the lake. Um, but as a parasitologist, I realize that there's quite a gap here. And so when you look at a water body in terms of the ecosystem and the diversity, um, if you omit the parasites, you're, you're, you're really missing a lot of information. And so this slide shows potential, well, actual life cycle pathways that we are we know are occurring in the lake based on the parasites that we found in fish in combination with knowing the life cycles of those parasites. We can make connections between the invertebrates and the vertebrates. And so what I want to do today is give you the parasitological perspective and, and bring that um, over to the fish side of things. And so when you, when you do parasitology on fish, you need to look at the fish in terms of what role is it playing in the life cycle? What, what kind of host is it? What role is it playing in the life cycle of the parasite? And I want to point out two generalizations here. And the first is if you find parasitic worms in the digestive system, whether in the stomach, the pyloric cecae, or the intestine, and you find that those worms are able to mature and you find eggs in their bodies and they're gravid, um, you can infer that that parasite is going to be transmitted out by the host's feces. And so here we have those are feces there, we have some hypothetical parasites, and so those parasites are going to move back down the food web and be in the benthos and then be acquired by invertebrates. Okay? And so um, you have to think about when you find a parasite in a host, in a fish, how is that parasite going to get out? And if it's in the digestive system, it's pretty obvious what's going to happen. Now, if you find parasitic worms elsewhere, such as in the insisted in the muscle or the body cavity, they don't really have an exit as per the host's normal behavior. And so you can infer that something else is going to have to happen here. For those parasites to move up the food web, as so many parasites do, this, this host is going to have to be preyed upon by some other animal, whether it's a bigger fish or some other vertebrate. And so in that first example, we would say here the fish is a definitive host, in other words, the host in which the parasite reaches sexual maturity. And in the second slide, the fish is an earlier host. We would call that an intermediate host, uh, which is uh, then going to need that, par that parasite needs that fish to be eaten so it will move up the food web to progress through its life cycle. And so what I want to do in these, in these slides is give you some examples of how looking at parasites, having a parasitological perspective can give you a window into host biology. And yes, a lot of these things you can learn by simply studying the hosts themselves, but I think there's something to be gained from the parasitological perspective. And so these examples will tell us something about the fish populations in terms of stocks. We can make inferences about the other species that are present, uh, invertebrates that are present or other vertebrates, so there will be examples of that. We can make inferences about the fish diet, its food web interactions. Um, I'll show some example, an example of parasite invasiveness, and then some examples of previously undocumented biological diversity. And so in this first example, we have walleye, and we have a couple sample sites. So there's, there's Otsego Lake there, and then this is the Susquehanna River, uh, a ways uh, south of Cooperstown, and in Otsego Lake, the walleye has been 
there's been a reintroduction, there's been a stocking program year after year. Uh, but the, the parasites that we find or don't find in walleye in Otsego Lake as compared to walleye down in the river can tell us that history, that stocking history. So in both walleye populations we have a tapeworm called um, Bothriocephalus cuspidatus. And walleye acquired this via consuming coke pot or probably a fish that's a carrier host, what we would call a keratinic host that holds the tapeworm. And so this is a generalist tapeworm. We find this tapeworm in other other fish in the lake. Um, but this down here is an acanthocephala, Neocanarhicus tenellus, tenellus. Um, fish would acquire this by ostracods. And this is more host specific. And so we've looked at a lot of fish, I didn't tell you that, but we've, been, we've looked at 1,600 individual fish of 44 species. And so we can make some statements now about what is or was, what is not in the lake. And this worm is not in the lake. And so the most of the walleye that we have, uh, the population in the lake, is, is from stocking. And the history there is that whatever low numbers the walleye were at, they, they either never had that worm in the lake or they were low enough that they lost that and the cycle wasn't retained. Whereas when we go to the Susquehanna River nearby, we find the Ocanarhicus tenellus. Um, here's another example about history of the fish. So Lake Whitefish is a really important fishery in Otsego Lake. And when I started 11 years ago, those, those fish were fairly rare. Um, and I'm happy to say in that the years, more recent years, the numbers are up. And we know that from DDC gill netting. Um, so the numbers of Lake Whitefish were low. We don't know how low they were, but they were never low enough to lose a certain parasite because they have the tapeworm called Proteocephalus. This is what it looks like on a, on a slide mount. Proteocephalus longicolis is, is host specific. We don't find it in other hosts except maybe chain pickerel because chain pickerel eat everything. Uh, but this is host specific. So by finding this worm in whitefish, we can make the inference that whitefish populations, no matter how small they got, they were adequate to, to sustain that parasite population. We can make some inferences about the invertebrates from looking at the list of parasites, for example, in largemouth bass. And so here's two samples, Otsego Lake and Mo Pond, which is also part of the, the biological field station. And so over the years, we've, we haven't looked at a ton of bass from the lake, 20, about two a year. Um, but they're great hosts. So we have here a couple species of acanthocephalins that the bass get from eating crustaceans, ostracods and amphipods, a couple species of spinatectus and nematode that they get from mayfly larvae. And a lot of these the bass will get from a carrier host, another fish. You know, once they get bigger, they're not going to waste time on amphipods. Uh, we have an, another nematode, a, a tapeworm, and a, a trematode. This Mo Pond is, is sort of a monotypic pond. There's mostly largemouth bass and a few brown bullhead and really nothing else. And so we don't see quite the parasite diversity here. We have a couple species in common with the bass in the lake. Um, but we have a worm in the pond that we don't have in the lake, and that's called Crepidosimum cornutum, which was actually described from Oneida Lake uh, by Van Cleve and Mueller in the 1900s. This is transmitted. Uh, it infects an arthropod probably a mayfly after going through a fingernail clamp. And so we don't have this worm in Otsego Lake. We're pretty confident it's not in the lake. And so uh, this is interesting because we're concerned about spirited clams and what their populations, how they're doing in, in light of zebra mussel invasions and other changes. So we, we have this, we have evidence that we've got these clams and we know that they're there in, in this water body called Mo Pond. And so that's the worm. Um, this is a trematode, about a quarter or half of a millimeter. It's affectionately called Boris in my lab. That's the ventral sucker there. And so Boris, or Crepidosmum, has this life cycle where uh, fingernail clams will become infected with an earlier stage, and then the cercaria leave the fingernail clam, colonize the mayfly larva, and then eventually make their way up to the bass. And so we might look at this picture and say, well, what's happening with fingernail clams in Otsego Lake? Um, but we have to be careful. But we, because we do have evidence from other parasites that our fingernail clam populations are still in Otsego Lake, this is confirmed by the malacologists at the station, uh, because we have one in Yellow Perch. Uh, this is called Bunadera. And so this also utilizes fingernail clams 
uh, different species as its first host. So there's evidently enough clams left in the lake, native clams, that we have this cycle going on. Okay. Um, speaking of five valves, yes, there's a lot of zebra mussels, and over the years as a parasitologist looking at guts, we run into stomach content, and so we can say at least at least these three fish are fighting the fight. And so over the years we've found uh, zebra mussel shell fragments and a lot of the white sucker, the carp, and even red breast sunfish. And probably there are other fish guts in the lake. We don't always look in the stomach. But at least these three fish are, you know, fighting the fight against the zebra mussel. So I wanted to give a nod to those species. Um, another example is the chain pickerel. So you have to be careful when you look at the parasites of the chain pickerel because they're such good piscivores that you don't necessarily know if you find a parasite in a chain pickerel, you don't know if it's a proper chain pickerel parasite or one that was in a fish it ate and it's simply trying to eke out some kind of existence after it ended up in the wrong gut. Okay, And so of the list of parasites here, at least these three species are questionable. Um, these probably aren't actually chain pickerel parasites, and they don't become sexually mature in the chain pickerel. They don't reproduce. You do not see eggs in their uteri um, because they belong in other hosts, but somehow they're living in the chain pickerel intestine. And I wanted to call your attention to this one on the bottom. Um, this is a, a tiny trematode. And so for about 10 years, we had the wrong idea about this work. Um, and this is really a plug for extended survey work, okay? So if you stop, you might, you might miss something. And in this case, this worm was the mystery worm in our lab. It's a tiny trematode. It's, it's about a fifth of a millimeter, so it's easy actually to miss. And we found this in chain pickerel at first during ice fishing season and then later on in summer. And of the 40 chain pickerel we examined over the years, we found six infected with this with this little trematode, that's an electron micrograph of it. We were able to identify it, even though the worms were not rabid, we could recognize it as a trematode of genus, um, excuse me, Cicincola. Um, but that's a trematode that's never been found in any Esoka before. It's, it's in bats. And it kind of looked like one called Cicincola parvulum from largemouth bass. Um, but we looked at this worm and said, well, if it's seeking colopargulum, how come we're not finding it in large amount of bass? Um, because we look at bass pretty consistently. Um, and we'd looked at bass for 10 years and not seen it. Well, during the 11th year, that story changed. And so after 11 years, we found last summer a worm. And these are to scale here. We found this worm here, which is a sexually mature seeking colopargulum. Okay? And so this is the proper host of this parasite. It, it's able to become rabid in the largemouth bass. And its cycle is, is a basically snail, fish, fish. And so if you look at these worms, yes, there's a couple testes there. You can, you can identify it to genus, but it's not, it's not fully maturing in chain pickerel. And, and you know, for a while, we wondered if we had a new species of Cicincola. But what we have is really chain pickerel, you know, having eaten largemouth bass and getting the worm when it was younger than this, and then the worm fails to really develop in the chain pickerel. And this is sometimes the chain pickerel can be a good host, and the worm can develop, and you call that post-cyclic transmission because it's after, kind of in addition to the, the proper life cycle. So you've got to be careful, and you've got to keep going and doing the routine survey work year after year, or you get, you, know, you get misled. This is the most invasive species of parasitic worm in the world. It's called the Asian fish tapeworm. If you've heard of it, it's the, it used to be called Bothriocephalus achilognathi. It's now in another genus, Skyzos cotyle. It's been reported from over 350 species of fish hosts on every continent except Antarctica. In the USA, it's been reported in 19 states um, until we started doing work in New York where it had not been reported. So New York is the 20th state where we have the Asian fish tapeworm. And so it seems highly likely that its high level of invasiveness, its success in colonizing fish from all over, it was described originally from grass carp. Um, you know, it's on every continent because it's a generalist. And we found it in 
in, uh, we found it over here in a small beaver pond for years. This is near the field station, and we have found it in the lake and in Susquehanna River. In, in uh, Cyprinids, in particular, Golden Shiner seems to be a good host. And if you go into the literature about the Asian fish tapeworm, there's a lot of suspicion that people, when they move around Golden Shiner, are, are you know, moving around the Asian fish tapeworm. So it could be that the Asian fish tapeworm was brought to New York from Great Lakes bait buckets. It's been in the Great Lakes for a while now. Um, and then it's been moving around. Again, I said it's been reported from 350 kinds of fish. In, the, in North America, it's been reported from 150 species. Um, of the 44 kinds of fish we've been studying, it's been reported in 15 of those, but we've found it only in four kinds of cyprinids. It hasn't gone over to like largemouth bass or some of these other hosts. Why not? It could be that perhaps because those other hosts are, are good hosts for other intestinal worms, that that's not an empty niche and the, and the Asian fish tapeworm is not able to go over. Whereas if you look at cyprinids, they typically are pretty boring in testing. They have more uh, metacercaria in their body, but you don't see many intestinal worms. So it's, it's perhaps uh, a story of an empty niche, and so these, these worms are able to move around well from cyprinid to cyprinid, whether it's golden shiner or creek chub, creek chub or fathead minnow or black chin. Um, so we, we have some of these, but fortunately they don't seem so pervasive in the lake. Okay, uh, here's an example where we can make inferences about other hosts, and yes, these hosts are obviously there, other vertebrates. This is yellow grub, that's an electron microscope picture. Um, that's a real nuisance for fishermen because they can really pock up your fillets and sometimes you can't even eat the fish if there's too many of them. Yellow grub uh, leaves the lake its definitive host is the great blue heron. Okay. The first host is a trematode, is a snail. We see these in all kinds of fish. Um, we've seen these in, in each of these yellow spots. You know, so most of the water bodies we examine, we know that we've got the snail, we've got the heron. So you can make an inference about that life cycle. Um, and I have never seen it this heavy in Otsego Lake. This is a picture from Minnesota from a vacation, vacation I was on. Um, so it's there, but it's, it's not as high a level to be such a nuisance as far as I can tell. Uh, finally, I want to put in a plug for simply you know, adding to our knowledge of biodiversity. So after 10 years of consistently looking at worms and trying to identify them, we have two new species of parasites out of the lake. We have a new species of acanthocephalin of the genus Neokinorhynchus from white sucker, great host. We've described this one that's done now. And we have a new species of nematode. So this is my cover slide. And this is spinatectus. Nematodes are kind of boring to look at. They have cool biology, but generally tube within a tube, you've heard that. Uh, but spinatectus is cool. Look at those spines, imagine that. So this doesn't have a sucker. It just kind of, it kind of, the spines kind of catch it, catch the side of the mucus of the intestinal lining, and they just kind of stay there. And these are tiny worms. Um, and we found them in, in several of the sit targets. And that one is, is an ongoing project. So I hope that you, you see you know, some advantage to the parasitological perspective. I'll leave you on a bright note. None of this would be possible without a huge list of students that have contributed over, over the years, <coughs> without my colleagues at Cobalt Skill and Oneana and the DEC who have contributed fish and, of course, funding. So thank you for your attention. <laughs>